Oh, no. All right. So welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and our topic this evening is going to be design trends and forecasts for 2021. The concept behind this is that we know a lot of people are looking to upgrade their buildings and individual units. And we have been very fortunate to be joined this evening with esteemed design houses, um, Suchi Reddy from the founder of ReadyMade. Um, we also have uh, Winston Kong, who is a partner at Champalamo Design and Doug Weinstein, who is our vice president here at ACAM. My name is Elise Rosemary, and I'm a vice president here at ACAM. Um, so just to give you a background of the beautiful work that our um, esteemed uh, colleagues here have done, um, Suchi Reddy is a leader in today's global design culture. Um, Reddy made architecture and design was founded by Suchi in 2002. Her work has been featured in a wide range of publications that include the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Dwell, Architectural Digest and Forbes. Um, some recent and upcoming projects include A Space for Being, which is a collaborative installation with Google. Um, it's going to be at the Johns Hopkins University, and it measures the impact of neuroesthetic design principles. Very interesting. Um, she's also working on a 30,000 square foot amenity um, roof space at a condominium project in Sunny Isles, Florida. Um, and the lobby there was designed by the late Carl Lagerfeld. Um, she has done many, many exciting projects and has won numerous awards, including the New York City Design Award, the AI Brooklyn and Queens Award, AI New York State Excelsior Award. I hope you're not getting too blushed here with all your award winning. Um, and I can go on. So thank you so much, Sushi, for joining. Um, equally um, talented, we also have Winston Kong. As I mentioned, he's a partner at Champalamo Design. Um, Champalamo Design is an award-winning multidisciplinary design firm with a commitment to creating unparalleled spaces for their clients and collaborators. Um, for the last quarter century, Champalamo Design has been recognized internationally for its visionary design concept and their, their imaginative and award-winning projects around the globe. Um, they work in hospitality, multifamily, private residential, new build, renovations, and adaptive reuse projects, which is very exciting. I'm going to also give uh, Winston some accolades here. Um, he has some of the projects he's done in New York City include the Central, the Kent, and Waterline Square. Um, they've done ultra luxury residential projects in um, Miami, as well as Hong Kong. And um, they have won over 41 design awards, including the 2020. When he had Asia Awards for their Raffles Hotel, which is beautiful, um, the 2019 Interior Design Magazine Award, um, 2019 L Decor A List Award. Are you blushing yet, Winston? Should I keep going? Should I list all 41? No, I'm kidding. But equally talented and um, fantastic designer. Um, and then we have our vice president at ACAM, Doug Weinstein, who has had over three decades of experience in all areas of residential, commercial, and industrial property management. And so we have him here tonight because he is a expertise in project management, which is something that we'll be talking to you this evening. So welcome and thank you for joining us. I would go on my accolades, but they're not nearly as long. So, so I'll keep it simple to just me. All right, so it's no secret that building common areas have become a vital aspect of residential and commercial design strategy. Um, and so while there might have been some shifts due, the, due to the pandemic, um, what do you feel at this point are some things that um, you know, you're seeing in, in residential buildings and what people are seeking now? And what do you forecast to be some trends that you see for the future? Um, well, I think that, you know, that it's been such an interesting time when people have been forced to spend so much time in, in their homes in places that, you know, they're not used to doing it. So I think the one kind of amazing thing about it that I've been seeing across the board and, you know, one of the nicest things about this time has been getting all these notes from our clients to say, we're so happy with the project. This is like saved us. You know, the family's amazing. We're all doing great here. This is wonderful is really that it's bringing home the sense of the quality of space, you know, that it's really, really important for people to be able to be part of the community, really feel that their spaces serve them well, and that they are made for them, that they're actually suited for them, because all of the kind of um, reduction of stress that that generates 
has huge value to people, I think. And so um, certainly from my own perspective of my interest in neuroaesthetics, as you mentioned, which is a study of how design and aesthetic experiences affect our brains and bodies, well-being and really feeling great in spaces, I think is going to be a huge trend in um, spaces as we continue to design them. Very interesting. What are some- um, I think, I think in, in, yeah, from our aspect, and we look at it in a couple of different ways in the sense of a lot of our buildings are, have already been, they're not ground up, they're not going in with initial amenities, but they're looking to either revamp their existing amenities or create new ones, basically to keep up with the market and keep up with the new construction out there. So what we see in a lot of the older buildings or a lot of the ones that wanna do their amenity spaces, again, we see different things that they want now. We see a lot of like, for instance, uh, people want pet spas in the building. People want wine storage, things that will again be competitive with the new construction out there. So we see in, a, in, a, <clears throat> in the older buildings wanting to get up to where the market is now and enhance their amenities so that their residents will be able to go to a bunch of different things within their community. That's interesting. Winston, what would you say regarding these? And I know that you've worked on some rehabs, um, really big projects. So I'm sure you have a lot of experience in this area. Um, what do you think are some vital design strategies for today's uh, market? I think Suchi hit it a little bit on the nose about something transformative, something that's home. Uh, I think a lot has to be said. People are looking, I think, for an escape, right? Especially in these times. But even pre-pandemic, I think people, at least, and at least you're familiar with the central, one of the guiding factors we pitched was this oasis away from the hustle and bustle of New York City. And you really want to come into your own world, even pre-pandemic, and you want to have a new way of life, something that responds to how you live and how one does live. And flexibility is key. Uh, Doug mentioned a few of the ideas of the wine rooms that a lot of the current ground up buildings have and those amenities like wine rooms, pet spots, pet store, uh, pet dog walk, um, dog washes. Those I think are already out there. In terms of the future, one of the things that we've seen because we do ground up, there was a definite switch towards I'm going to say one is wellness and fitness. You know, everybody has the fitness room. The wellness center is another component. And the central uh, has a bit of that with its treatment rooms, the showers, the steam, et cetera. But there's even talk about is there a way to incorporate maybe a medical facility? Alexandra uh, attempted that, not in a multifunctional space or condo building, but she did try to bridge at one point uh, in Connecticut, a place called Shireen, which was wellness, yoga, and some medical capabilities. So I think there's gonna be an attraction towards that. I'm working on a project right now in Naples mm -hmm. with an older demographic where um, treatment is important and wellness is important. Um, fitness, you know, is another one. Previously, I think fitness rooms, for instance, uh, it's a social, in some ways it can be a social activity, meaning there's a soul cycle, et cetera. But now with Peloton and with the pandemic, you know, you can kind of, you don't need to bring your trainer in. Your trainer is actually interactive. And there's this higher engagement we see in an, in an attention to fitness and combining it with wellness. There was also in some of our, the project that you might see later in Fisher Island, Palazzo del Luna, there's a, a little bit of a shift with an F and B uh, venue, and that's a very hard thing to incorporate into 
the multifamily or condo developments because it raises prices on HOA, your, your fees, basically, condo dues and fees. And so how do you balance that? Fisher Island, you know, Plaza del Luna on Fisher Island had a shot at doing it because they're an island and there's limited spaces, places to eat outside. I think there are like three restaurants. But after that, they're also very expensive. So they were able to somehow balance those numbers and get that to work. And then with the pandemic, not being able, with restaurants closed, et cetera, how, how great is it to have in your lobby or as one of your amenities a place to have a drink or have a light snack or fare? It's really fantastic, and I've been privy to that. Uh, we're also speaking to another developer in, actually, in Florida, who's considering bringing in the F and B venue. We're and a that's a beach. With people who've been doing that, that I see, I, I concur with Winston. I really think that's a huge trend, and um, yeah. this idea of tech of in this time of distance that you can really work out by yourself now. Mm -hmm. um, and STEM lab, yeah. So is that kind of, also, oh. sorry, I was gonna say, is that shifting the way that you view common areas? And, you know, Doug, you were just speaking to additions of pet spas and um, wine storage, mm -hmm. but, you know, are there ways that you're seeing um, buildings rethink spaces um, and, you know, prioritizing certain um, advancements, even in an older building over others to kind of go with what you're, you know, the current trend is. I well, I think one has, of the things that, and to, okay. to go on to what, with, to what Winston was saying before, one of the things that we're seeing uh, that has been prevalent in new construction, but is also now coming into older rehab is that not, a, not necessarily a full service F and B, but we're seeing a lot of automated for lack of a better word, high-end convenience rooms in buildings where someone can go in and get a prepackaged salad, a sandwich, wine, beer, that type of thing. And some of the older buildings are looking to incorporate that, again, taking their lead from the newer construction amenities. That's absolutely right. It's funny you say that because one of the projects we were working on, which had a younger demographic, um, the targeted demographic in Hong Kong was in their 20s, uh, early 30s, first home buyers, their parents may help them. They did, we did include an F&B venue. Uh, I think some of you, Doug, or Doug, you're talking about pet spas. One of the pitches that we had that the marketing team wanted, but it, it didn't get finalized, it didn't, get done was not only a pet spa but almost like a pet hotel meaning you travel a lot you know and i found it very interesting because we we try to develop the idea um when you travel where do you who keeps your dog you do you keep it with a dog walker do you find a friend who can house it you know normally you take that to a pet hotel but well, what is the amenity and they do larger developments, understandably, in Hong Kong than we have here in New York, you know. Mm -hmm. So could you get the numbers to work? And is there a viable space, uh, place for that? Because I recently got a puppy, and it would be great to have uh, someone we could leave it with <laughs> that may have friends within the building. You know, the dogs may have friends within the building. But I think it became a touchy subject. In, um, from a liability standpoint, but it was still nonetheless um, an interesting aspect, you know. Um, I'm just curious, Winston, what kind of puppy did you get? <laughs> I got a long haired corgi. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you did mention the needs of a, a preference for your particular new need. Um, what other, you know, People are always wondering, especially with older buildings, how are they going to make upgrades so that way they compete can compete with the newer um, buildings? And is there any, you know, things that you think are not to say quick flips, but you know, to enhance the building and, and transform the space so that it still feels relevant um, and it's not antiquated? Well, I think one of the things that you need to look at with older buildings 
is when you have to look in and you have to review your existing spaces and their use. And one of the things, particularly in older buildings, there was when they were designed with amenity spaces, they were designed with amenity spaces from 30, 20, whatever years ago. And uses have changed. So the first step is to go in and analyze what's there and what you can do with it and how you can transform it. So that's from what we see when we, when we go start working with our boards is to find out what people want we also will do a lot of times we'll do use surveys with existing buildings to see what amenities the residents are interested in and then go to a design and what we can and cannot do. Interesting. And what about, what were you gonna say, Suchi, regarding uh, this topic? Uh, I was just gonna say that, you know, I, I am finding that um, while we are working on a, a large, um, uh, complex where we have amenities, we're designing amenities like ice rinks and bowling alleys, like what you're seeing here, and a salt spa, you know, which is a very special kind of a new um, idea um, for health and well being again. And, you know, is, is a trend that's catching on, or a cigar bar, like you see here, you know, or a wine cellar, which we're doing all of these things. We're doing sort of a Wall Street room, we're doing um, a, even a sort of a private, um, a, this is our ice rink. Um, a personal sort of a nightclub where you could have your own party for, you know, a small group of people, which could be um, kind of a great thing, <clears throat> especially in these times, it almost seems prescient that the development that we were working, we're working on um, actually was geared towards that, was geared towards privacy, was geared towards sort of smaller groups, was geared towards intimacy while providing kind of the grandeur of a big experience, you know, because I think one of the things that we're all missing so much during these times is the fact that you could be in this kind of glittering underwater ice cave, which I designed as an ice rink, but you could, you know, you want to be with other people at the same time, you know, but now we, we, we long for the kind of beauty of these experiences, but we, can, we know we can't be there with like hundreds of people that we don't know. So it's really nice to, I think, also as a trend project kind of the balance of this kind of intimate but great experience. And I do think some of these things are actually excellent retrofit ideas, because what you could do is it doesn't require going into a building and saying, I need like this big of a huge space in order to do this. There are small ways in which you, we could really work with it to say we could offer you this. And they're very, very simple things, you know, like elements like light or plants or nature or redesigning a, a port cochere or making sure that the entry has a beautiful element um, like this that catches your eye, you know, that gives people something to relate to, it gives them a talking point. It's something that they relate to their neighbors with. These kinds of things aren't big projects. They don't cost a lot of money, but if they're done judiciously and thoughtfully, I think within an interesting space can really make it feel fresh and new um, in a way, like lighting, for instance, is a huge factor. It could be so easy. It's like jewelry, you know, you change the jewelry and it's a whole new outfit mm -hmm. and you could really, you know, be another person that evening if you wanted to. So it's really that kind of thing that I think also there will be, I personally think there'll be three kinds of classes of buildings that tend to start upgrading themselves, whether it's doing things like making sure our entry doors, like we, we are showing you in this slide on the left, which is like, you know, beautifully detailed and gives you the sense of opulence and, and it's just a question of changing the doors, or it's a question of finding that perfect piece of art that anchors a waiting area, a lounge, a space, you know, that could be rotating, that could be a, a partnership with an amazing gallery because the arts need support right now. And there are so many ways in which that we could actually be able to support the arts or introducing these kinds of magical moments of light, you know, how existing light that's coming into the space yeah. could be played with so you could do something, you know? So there's simple things that I think can be done. That's one class of work. There's another class of work where you could take existing smaller spaces and make them very intimate. And then there are other things like we've done, you know, installations that are exterior, like sculptures that are outside. So if there is kind of a, a, a open air space, which these days becomes so precious and certainly in your buildings in, in Florida, 
you know, if you could create like a sculpture like we did here, and which is this big X that we did in Times Square, which is both a gathering spot, it lights up when more people get there. So it shows kind of the power of love, the power of community. If you could do those kinds of things, I think you're giving people a reason to want to live in these places that makes them very special and very unique. You know, you could use simple elements like color, wallpaper, you know, these are things that I think could be done fairly easily and well for all kinds of budgets. Great. And I know that Winston, you had a really um, big New York project that underwent a huge renovation um, that I believe is the palace. Yeah, here we go. Oh uh, yeah, the New York palace, you know, Suchi, you know, I want to touch back with what Doug and Suchi said and Doug was talking about the analysis of the existing conditions, which is absolutely important. I think equally important too is the analysis of the market value, um, trends versus substance, demographic, budget, schedule, all of client vision, all of them play an important role in your approach to a renovation, so to speak. In terms of, um, I, I think Suchi, you're absolutely correct when you say lighting um, in terms of transforming the space for a small cost or a little cost. Well, some would say it's not so cheap, but uh, <laughs> in terms of what it does for the space is completely uh, transformative. The other thing, and you hit it as well towards the end with the finishes and things such as wall covering, what we're showing at the palace, which is not a condo, but if you think about it, surface finishes. Um, analyzing what dates the space. This is the New York Palace that you see before. And it had a motley assortment of colors, not, in, um, not just in the marbles, just in general. And by streamlining that to make it, and I'm sure it was grand back in the heyday, streamlining, taking what you can do and just changing the surface finishes. The red marbles in the columns below existed. We did gut the floor and we did extend the fireplace detail on the lower floor to give a grander sense of arrival off of Madison when you approached. And it's literally paint um, and plaster. But just when we designed this uh, several years ago, you know, we thought that cleaning it up would actually help transform it and keep it or make it appear fresh. I think there's also this, this idea of comfort, you know, that I forgot to touch on. And Winston, I think it's it's so beautiful to see this, how you guys are working with like scale and proportion in this image where you're really like anchoring and doing all of this beautiful like jewelry and lighting. But the spaces also need to feel comfortable, I think, for people more and more, you know. Yeah. No, absolutely. And there is a trend where, you know, a long time ago when we started out, uh, in the, con the multifamily developments, I think the wood finishes uh, tended to be a little bit shinier. <laughs> and, you know, the stones tend to be more polished. And, you know, uh, years later, here we are, and we're going to, I don't want, rustic would be the wrong approach, but something maybe more honed stone finishes and uh, lighter woods that, not a, that aren't rustic. I think rustic is going away, but lighter and brighter, things that feel refreshing. And it's funny, this morning I read a post about, you know, maybe that look is going away and we're gonna go back to more warmth. So again, trends, you know, they're, they're fickle, they, they shift. <laughs> and so we, we do have to analyze what truly is substantial and what's there to stay. You know, and that's a really interesting question Winston. about longevity, I think, you know, it's like when you come up with a design, you want it to be able to last for a while. And this is an interesting problem that I know both Winston's firm and, and mine deal with, where we know that, you know, and that's why, you know, we tend to be fairly classic in terms of the choice of materials, because you're not, this isn't something you're going to change every year or every two years. You want what you do to really be able to stand the test of time and really be welcoming and nice to people. You know what I mean? That, that people can feel a relationship. So really having these kinds of rich materials and beautiful things. And I'm always a, a fan of texture. If it's not super rough, I'm always like, you know, I wanna feel like I wanna touch things. 
and touching them. Even if you can't touch them, you want to feel like you want to touch them, you know, and that is immediately a connection to a space that, 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 that it creates without you even knowing that that's what you're feeling. You know what I mean? So as designers, there's a lot of tricks that we, we can employ to make people feel connected and welcome in spaces. Do you generally um, recommend that people stick with their current time? For example, if a building is made in the 1960s and it hasn't been touched since, would you recommend that you, you know, enhance that? Or do you usually, you know, go right to the future and design that way? What do you think is the that's best way? Because I know- question. Yeah. That's an absolutely great question. Um, I think it depends on how well it was designed, you know? If it, <laughs> If it was like a model of the highest form of 60s design, absolutely, you could keep that and play with it. If it wasn't, and if it was a mediocre effort at doing that, then I think it, it leaves it. So it's really a question of, you know, the quality of what you're looking at. It's just, you know, what this is what we do as designers all the time. We're assessing the quality of things. We're assessing mm -hmm. the quality of what we us to find the median that's actually going to be great for the client and really make it the space that they're gonna, you know, and there is that feeling like when a place is beautifully designed and you walk into the lobby of your building and you feel like this is home and this is incredible and it elevates your spirit, that's what we wanna do, you know? And that's our like honor and our privilege as designers to like make that happen for people. And it's absolutely possible to do that. I think regardless of the style, regardless of the budget, you know, there's ways in which to do it. You just need, um, a willing client and a, a collaborative designer in order to be able to get that to happen. And that's the only way you get good design. Mm -hmm. Do you, okay, so I know that a lot of buildings usually um, don't wanna do capital improvements all at once because it's obviously a very big expense for, and it's time consuming and it involves a lot of planning and strategy. So with that being said, if you had to make an you know, executive decision and I guess it, it's all things being equal, would you upgrade lobby, hallway, or amenity space, meaning roof deck, um, common workspace these days, um, given you know the option to improve only one at a time? This could be anyone. I think I think from our aspect, um, you know, we the, you know, hearing Suchi and hearing Winston, and you know, and their phenomenal designs and everything. But it comes down to us to be you know, the ones that we we're, we handle the logistics and we figure out how our clients are going to pay for it. So one of the things that we have to do, uh, at least, is is as you mentioned, one of the things that we have to do is create a comprehensive plan on a building that is wants to do numerous projects, and it goes anywhere from within budget constraints to logistical constraints. You know, for instance, if you have a lobby, depending upon how that lobby is laid out, for instance, you may be changing the layout, you may have to move people in different traffic patterns. So it all goes into the planning mm -hmm. and the logic and I think on how to do back an to existing what building. Saying, uh, doing the intake, right, Doug, of that you would, yeah. you would assess from your population what they think is the most important thing. Right, I think it's yeah. not only, you're right, I think it's not only that, but you also, and we get asked a lot, not, you know, from, from a logistic and, and a construction point is when we're dealing with amenities, is, is there any ROI in amenities? And we always talk about how there's two ROIs in amenities. The one is a literal ROI if you're doing an amenity space in some buildings that have a income producing capability. Like if you're doing a, a party room or you're doing a billiards room or something that the, that the association can garner in, income from. Uh, and that's, very, that's, that's a very concrete idea. But then the figurative ROI is what is that amenity renovation and the beauty that, that, that Winston and Suji are bringing to your building is gonna increase your property value. And that's an unseen ROI, but it's definitely something to consider when an association is doing their planning. And that's absolutely right. And it's, it, you know, the figurative <clears throat> ROI that transforms um, space, really what you're looking for is something that transforms lives, how we live, how do the residents live. And 
you know, Sutri kind of hit it with that exterior space. From a cost standpoint, exteriors are a lot um, less expensive to renovate than interior spaces, but provide such a wonderful outlet and need. Um, we don't always have it penned in the cities you're in, particularly in New York, Hong Kong, areas that are tight, that really have dense populations and land is so expensive. If you can provide some form of outdoor amenity, uh, whether it's summer grills, summer kitchens, dog runs, dog walks, uh, at least uh, you remember the one at the Central, we had the dog run. I'm sure that's going to get plenty of views. You know, we had the great second floor outdoor terrace that was a backdrop and a, in some ways a party room, an outdoor party room that uh, was accompanied by the interior lounges and game areas and public amenities. You know, and we're, we see that more more than more often that we're, a lot of developers, even in Florida that does have space or a project in Atlanta that we're working on, the, the exterior and outdoor experience was equally important because that's really transformative for life and how we live. I totally agree with Vincent. I'm on the board of my building, which is on Lower Fifth in, in New York in, in the village. And you know, we put in the little gardens in front of our building. And of course, because I'm the architect on the board, I got to be <laughs> you know, instrumental in having to do this work for the building. Um, but it's fabulous, you know, it's the change that it makes. It affects everyone. That's the other yeah. thing about, about what Winston's saying about the exterior and about these things like, you know, just making, making changes to exterior lighting, for example, you know, and the way yeah. in light a building these days if there are details on the building that could be highlighted you know you give it a new look right. there's so many ways in which to think about this that really could um, upgrade both people's value the effort that they put into it and really you know create this feeling of belonging to something that's elevated i think that's a very interesting point because i think a lot of times people overlook the aspect of the entire building's exterior and they focus on, you know, how it feels when you walk in the door, which is obviously very important. Um, but the exterior is obviously a huge, it's what you see before you walk in the door. So you do have to make sure um, that the lighting and, you know, all that is still updated in the same regard that you would update the interior. And I know that both of you um, also do interior design work as well, in addition to just building um, design for in, in its um, in general. So what are some of the uh, trends that you see for an interior meeting, you know, solely focused on, on one's apartment um, that you foresee um, coming into the, the next few years? Well, I think coming out of this pandemic or certainly enduring the pandemic, um, the transformation of um, any space into a workspace becomes a priority yeah. for a lot of people, you know, so it's almost small things like furniture that could multitask, you know, screens that could provide you um, acoustic and, and privacy while, you know, your kids are making noise in the back or, you know, all of these other kinds of things. And they're really small interventions to tell you the truth. Um, I was interviewed the, the other the other week about um, uh, scent and smell because this is something also that I'm really into. And this, this idea that like, even with the smell, you could change the smell of a building, the smell of a space you know, to really start to give people like, calm them or you know to allow them to work better like they're very small and subtle things that could be done but I would say the the biggest trend that I'm seeing is both between fitness including fitness in the house if it wasn't there before or being able to be sure that um, working space allows privacy um, security and acoustic privacy yeah flexibility is key uh, what we're seeing definitely work space outside of one's condo or one's home. You know, in another project in Hong Kong, they were asking us because of the demographic and the units were very small, not unlike New York, but even smaller. Uh, they were asking us to look into STEM labs, uh, places for people to congregate and work, and also work labs and work libraries that had the ability to be flexible, even pre-pandemic or uh, social, where you could gather in larger groups. 
So that type of was, element, it, you know. Right. Just to, just to dovetail on Winston on what you just said, bringing it back to the, the leaving the apartment milieu for a minute, but bringing it back to the the amenities. One of the things that we see the older buildings doing, or the, the you know not so young buildings, is taking what they used to call a business center, which basically yeah. used to be a with a conference table and a couple of phones in it. And they're looking to do more of a, for lack of a better word, a WeWork type situation where to transform that space into more of individual workstations where, you know, people can come, you know, they may be having a guest in their apartment who needs to do a conference or something along those lines. So we're seeing that as one of the big trends in, in, in the amenities is transforming that big center into a more workable individual social oh, environment you know it's funny you say that because the business center and i'm going to share a story uh we did a condo reno here in the city and the business center what we redid the business center as well and the business center had a couple offices the conference room where the condo board gathered and the president of the board at the time was like you know don't make it too large. What we have is a gentleman running his business out of the business center and um, just basically hogging all the time, so to speak. <laughs> so that has to be watched. But I do see a trend coming back towards that business center and how we work. And you hit it, Doug, because one of the things that we did in Hong Kong on this project was we were gathering, they had a big wide hall corridor that uh, connected some of the different public amenities. And we turned that hall into a library hall with a little uh, nook or niche, if you will, that had workspaces. So it wasn't just a grand hall. It actually was a usable hall and a usable amenity. And it also provides some beauty, just the idea of um, a library in the hallway. I wish I could share that with you, but unfortunately I can't share that. You, know, it's you, you brought up, Winston, you brought up a very good point. You just brought up a very good point. And what we see, and I don't know, Suchi and Winston, if you've seen this as well, but in some of the buildings that are looking to redo amenity spaces and that you look at the design and you look at the, the physical plant of that, of that amenity spaces, you're finding in the older, particularly in some of the older buildings where there was an incredible amount of wasted space mm -hmm. yeah. when they did the original design. And so in looking at that, when we go into a building, we'll look to see what we can reclaim and, and, and really just totally transform what before, and people are astonished when they go, I, I didn't know we had this much room. Yeah, Doug, that's right. such a Point. I think technology's improved, you know, to the point where things yeah. have been priced to some degree, and we can actually steal this kind of space back, even if it is an alcove that provides, you know, a beautiful lit niche that you can get out of a, of a mechanical room. That right. You can do change the shape of what you're experiencing. But I've been super excited actually about this kind of, and this isn't so particularly new, this, this blend of. Kind of hospitality and, and residential, you know, it's almost like feeling like you're in a hotel when you're home, but you're in, at home when you're in a hotel, like there's always this kind of blend that you want to give people for a certain sense of luxury. And I think that's actually easy enough to achieve with little things and could be easy to achieve with little things, I should say. So, but yes, you're absolutely right. And it's always fun when you're a designer and you find that extra space and you're like, oh my God, yes. here's what we can do. It's, it's a really well, Suchi, you hit on another very important thing that's transforming spaces, which is technology. For that same project in Hong Kong, and you might have the slide here, one of the things we saw, and we, we talked about it earlier with everyone, is the flexibility of multi, or what you call multifunction spaces. Meaning, uh, we did it at the Chamberlain here in one of the slides where the, fit, um, the sports hall was, had a rock climbing wall, but on certain nights uh, in the evenings, you could pull down a screen and it becomes movie night, in, uh, so to speak. And that's been done numerous times. 
in Hong Kong, we took it to another level because of the technology. And there's this, I think it's, it's kind of like a Wii. It's a video game that you project onto a wall and allows kids to play various types of games on there. We also introduced the ABS um, glass floor in the gym, which has all, you, you can see in this older style of uh, fitness hall, the basketball, um, a little bit of a hockey puck, etc. But if you go to the sketch, the 3D sketches, um, the kind of black and white, these, this is in Hong Kong. There's a video game that's projected onto a wall. And then if, and all of the floors, the basketball, whether it's squash, basketball, or short court tennis, that floor is a glass floor with an LED light that allows you to change the game on the floor. And we designed it in such a way, uh, you know, that the, the walls were in wood paneling. So we spent a bit of money on the wood paneling of the walls. So it became more of a convention hall when it wasn't being used as a sports hall. And this happens to be movie night, uh, so to speak, if need be. That looks very fun. I would like that in my own house right now. <laughs> I think yeah. also for COVID, New York buildings should consider rooftop outdoor screenings. Oh, yeah. yeah. Those would be really, really yeah, great. Yeah, that, you know? we were pushing that in the great lawn of this project, just like you have in Central Park, an outdoor movie night. And yeah. we're considering it for a project uh, in Florida, although the temperature might not be conducive to that, mm -hmm. but yeah. we'll see where that goes. I love it. So I want to um, open up the conversation now to have some Q and A for for everyone, um, because I know that a lot of times you attend these and you're like, oh, I wish I thought of that after. So we do want to give people the opportunity um, to type in their questions into the Q and A area, and that way Suchi um, or Winston can answer them, or Doug uh, also can answer them for you. And if we miss any, um, please let us know at the end of this, so we will be providing you with all of our emails and we're happy to answer questions. But just to kick it off, um, I received one question already. Uh, what materials are you typically using or seeing in renovated lobbies? Um, are you looking for marble versus onyx or granite? Is wood veneer popular? Also decorative painting versus wallpapering? Multiple. All of the above. <laughs> it really, if, if I went where to go first, it really depends again on the analysis of the market. Who is the target demographic? Which city? Age group? Everything. Durability, I think, has to be paramount, though, in any public space. So when you mentioned Onyx or something like that, it really depends on the applique. But all of the above, and you know, so many things affect that. Budget, city, demographic and what client vision, what are we trying to achieve? And then we, we analyze all of that before we come up with our vision to, um, that hopefully is in alignment with the clients. Yeah, we've also been looking at you know, such a, a place for innovation also that we've been looking at uh, newer kind of composite materials, 3D printed sections of relief, you know, things like that that can be made out of very durable materials like nylon or cast and metal, you know, that that's pretty easy and very special that could even be inserted into existing walls so that you don't have to do the whole wall. Um, but essentially, um, exactly as Winston was saying, um, the durability is a huge factor and the maintenance, you know, you've got to look at like what the building can take care of in terms of maintenance, what's their program, right. what can they support and really make it easy for them because you really want your design to look great and it's not going to look great if it can't be maintained. So we really- Well, I think that that's, that's an, a, an incredibly good point because of course, you know, we as, as project managers and stuff, one of the things that we look at and our, our clients ask us exactly is, what's the maintenance gonna be on this material? How, how well is it gonna stand up? You know, am I gonna be now having a maintenance budget three times what I had 
because you're putting something in that requires such a cleaning process that only a special guy from you know the wilds of Borneo can do. So that's one of the things we look at. That's why we love designers. <laughs> yeah, um, and our approach, whether you know, for instance, our approach to a luxury condo versus a luxury rental would be different in terms of material choices for exactly that reason, the durability factor. You know, and also, you know, one of the questions I ask a lot when we embark on projects, especially at ground up, would be the targeted price point and the demographic of who's going to live there. Because people treat things differently when it's not their own versus when it's their own, and also the cost. You know, different ages, age groups affect perhaps some of the materials that we might select if it's a younger demographic versus an older demographic could affect our material choices. Yeah, we literally sometimes look at how many strollers go through the building. You know, exactly. Things sure that the corners can actually handle that. You know, it's not just the carts and the luggage, but it's really... What kind of materials do you design? I, we, uh, sometimes I almost start from the corners because I want to make sure that those will look great. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, kind of go out to the rest of it. But uh, it has to be appropriate to the building and the denizens within. Makes sense. Would you say, um, since you're saying appropriate to the building, you know, for now that we've experienced the pandemic, do you think that? buildings are going to utilize common spaces that they once did, you know, in, in the multidisciplinary rooms, like party rooms, what have you. Do you think that those are still going to be an asset to a building or do you think people are going to need to rethink those spaces? I think they will still be an asset. You know, humans, you know, we're, we're social beings and they still will be. I think the question has to come is how, how do we get to congregate together in, in this uh, post-COVID or current climate uh, safely and still feel safe? Is there a need for a test in prior to being used? I think those, you know, it's interesting. I'm working on a luxury senior living uh, building and we're, we're very concerned about how do you gather, concerned what happened and should we be creating spaces that allow uh, testing or pre-testing and allow visitation? So I think some of these have to be uh, looked at, pending how does the vaccine work and how do we uh, fare in the next year, half a year, year, two years, and how does this pandemic hit us? And that will affect what happens to some of those public amenities. Do you have to take off a certain part? Do you have to subdivide it somehow? Um, do you have to create flexible walls that, not unlike a hotel ballroom, that can uh, reduce in size or expand through air walls or nano walls? I mean, we're talking to, uh, I definitely think I agree with Winston, these spaces will be used. We do need to congregate. We do need to feel a sense of connection. And, you know, we're even talking to a client where we could maybe use some of these spaces while they're not able to be used by the entire populace to maybe have um, somebody perform in that space, you know, and be able to broadcast that to everyone in the building. So it's almost on private concert in this space. Perhaps you can see it that way. You know, there's there's ways in which I think these spaces will tend to be flexible, perhaps over the next 12 months, but I think we'll definitely find a way to reincorporate um, some of these aspects back into our lives. We have to. We have to. And I think also, also one of the things that, and I think <laughs> Susie had mentioned uh, technology before, in getting these spaces to be repurposed or reused, one of the things that's going to be paramount to people's well-being and sense of well-being is the environmental atmosphere in these spaces. And there's a lot of new technology coming out uh, in not only just in response to the pandemic, but just evolved over the last few years, where with clean air, with air movement, with things such as that, to, even to when we repurpose these spaces and use these spaces again, the technology will be there in the actual MEP or the mechanical portions 
of right. these spaces to create a healthier atmosphere. Yeah, um, that's it's interesting. Speaking of, I guess, more technical questions, um, do any of our panelists have experience with elevator cab renovations? And if so, can you, you know, speak to this? Absolutely. I mean, this this ends up being uh, something we renovate in most of the buildings that we work with. And um, certainly post pandemic, um, we've been looking at, you know, cleanable surfaces, like generally there used to be this trend of being able to use, you know, intricate materials or like woven metal meshes and things like that, which are like very difficult to clean. And um, certainly not something that, that we're going towards. Um, so absolutely looking at lots of, it's the kinds of materials that we use. Like typically when you look at an elevator cab, you're looking at the materials and the lighting really generate that feeling in the space you know um, and also the limited capacity of these of these spaces now and while people need to wait to be able to use the elevators so to also make sure that the space outside offers a place for someone to wait or you know gives them something to look at or do or whatever you know if there's a screen there between the elevators that can that can keep you entertained while you're waiting for the next thing so you're not feeling like your building isn't serving you you know like there are things like that that we're definitely talking about um, constantly with our clients interesting um, and so again um, also more utilization of space and more technical questions here um, how are buildings using storage spaces like bike racks and luggage carts these days? Are, are they updating? Are they trying to make them modern? Or are they just, you know, keeping them status quo? Uh, I haven't heard too much about uh, bike racks or luggage ones. We tend to luggage carts. You know, we, our approach to luggage carts is they should never be seen. We take the approach from our hospitality background. We, they need to be convenient, they need to be close to the entry, but that's not the first thing I'd like to see when I enter the building. You know, we talked about ROIs before, the exteriors, the lighting of the exteriors, and the value to buildings, you know. We, we, and our, the, our hotel background tells us there has to be that sense of arrival, and a luggage cart is not something that anybody wants to see up front. Uh, so to us, we try to discreetly tuck them away behind a curtain or a niche or a built-in if possible, whenever Not possible. Loaded up with gifts that have your name on it, Winston. So they're waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. The bellhops don't like me. <laughs> uh, they have to travel further to get the clutch card. But uh, you bring up a good point, Elise, uh, which is, and we touched upon it earlier, which is the use of um, space that might be carpeted now for greater amenities. And that's always something that we should strive for. You know, we have a lot of experience working with a very great fellow who, who's with Blackstone. And he was a genius at transforming dead space into usable, uh, what we call revenue generating space or rev generators. You know, we at the Western St. Francis, probably over 15 years ago, if you guys know that hotel, it was a very grand hotel in San Francisco. And they had these marvelous lobbies that tourists just walked around and, you know, lounged at. And, we took some of that space and created a Wi-Fi lounge and a coffee lounge. And it, you know, I think back then it might have generated a million dollars in revenue the first year. And this is almost around the time Starbucks is coming out That's with that social gathering space. Well, you spoke to some sort of similar, in the similar realm, um, have you seen any um, you know, buildings obviously right now are taking in a lot of packages, right? Probably even more than before because people are shipping. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen bigger package rooms as a trend or do you see Amazon storage lockers in spaces? Um, you know, how do you perceive buildings handling packages in a more hospitable way? I honestly think this is something that's here to stay. I think even when yeah. we go back doing what we do or what we used to do, I think this is something that's going to stay. This is definitely a problem that 
um, every building, including mine, um, has to look at. You know, in my own building, we were looking at, you know, even purchasing one of the units that came up for sale on the ground floor so that we could actually use that as sort of handy storage. So there's definitely that, but there's also, I think, um, lots of sort of um, technology, again, here plays a great part, where if you could use some kind of a virtual doorman service in a place where they could be stored so people can retrieve at their own times, because what we're seeing is also that, especially in a place like New York, people aren't there all the time. You know, um, people are either away in the country or come back, and, you know, there's kind of an accumulation that they have to deal with. So it is uh, certainly a, a hot button issue and something that every building or that we know that we're working in is looking to find space to accommodate. That's absolutely right, Sushi. Technology, what we've seen, and I think, I don't think we've seen buildings uh, suddenly start saying we need larger package rooms, but I think they are going to have to, uh, just based on what's going on now. And even before that, people are buying and shopping more online. The, the, the pain that the retail sector is feeling tells you that. Uh, one of the things we've seen is how do you do dry cleaning and that um, virtual concierge. And a building, I think it was in DC that we were working on, did have kind of like a, this two-way locker system where the dry cleaners had access to the key. You could put your, your clothes to be taken there and they would come back and open it from the back end not in like a double-sided mailbox and bring back your dry clean and leave it there without even the doorman coming in. So it's almost like virtual cleaning services. And that was that was the first time I heard of that. We're seeing we're seeing a request, Winston, in, in light of what you said, we're seeing requests now with particularly if someone's doing a lobby renovation or a front desk renovation. We're seeing a lot more of incorporating package storage, dry cleaning storage in the mill work that's being done in these lobbies or the, or the concierge stations that are being done, as well as more efficient rooms. Uh, and again, as Suchi said too, is you know catering to people who wanna come in at two o'clock in the morning and get their package from earlier that day. So this is going to be a big a big issue going forward. That's Correct. interesting. Um, so now we have a little bit more specific to design questions. Um, if a building has old granite walls, what options does a building have to repurpose its wall and columns? If any. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Okay. No, <laughs> well, you could cover them. <laughs> it depends on what the condition of the granite is, honestly. Um, uh, so there are some very beautiful granites that could be uh, partially integrated with other materials to really generate a new look, I think. Um, that's something that we've done in the past quite successfully. Um, and then there's other times when we just have to remove it. It really just depends um, on what it is. I mean, granite is such an amazing material because it's so durable. Um, but it really depends. There's such a huge variety of granite that it really depends what was picked and what era. The, and I agree. You can cover it. And we, the, the New York Palace had a similar issue. Granted, that wasn't granite. That was marble. Um, you know, granite is one of those materials, and I love it partially because of its durability, but it dates the building and it dates the design because it was so heavily used from in a certain time period. And it's hard to transform or give your, sometimes give your space a, a new look or a refreshing look with the use of granite. The color also depends, right? And the texture, whether it's leathered or not, that could change it. But that's also costly to do a leathering process to granite that's on a vertical surface or in an existing condition. What we did at the what we did at the New York Palace was, uh, and you have to protect it. If you were to go back to that uh, slide, the red marble that were were in between the styles and rails of the column, we literally kept the Carrara on the styles and rails, and just on the inset which had red marble, we put plaster over it. So the marble, we didn't have to demo the marble. We just covered it, and yet it changed the color palette of the space. 
and the look and feel. More applique than demo. But plaster chips, so you have to protect the edges or the outside corners. And it depends on where it's used. There you go. All of that, all of the red marble uh, on the slab and on the lower columns, we literally just colored it in purple, in white plaster. Thanks. So you, you obviously both have a lot of experience with repurposing spaces, enhancing spaces. Um, this is kind of a two-in-one question. One would be, um, how would you, you know, if you're looking to certain demographics, do you have any tips for designing common spaces for older demographics? And if, if you're working in a space that you need to reprogram, what would you suggest as far as um, making it more modern for an incoming generation. So these are both, I guess, generational questions, but buildings do face this. Um, I guess the first one would be, how do you um, handle for an older generation? I think accessibility is so important. And I think honestly, whether it's older or it's just uh, being able to be welcoming to a differently abled population mm -hmm. anywhere is something that's really important. So there's, you know, small things like, the introduction of a chair rail, which is a very traditional element, but to be able to do that even in a kind of a modern way that could make it kind of hospitable to um, an older generation could be really great. You know, it's just a small things that allow people to feel safe and to feel, you know, like they can access things easily enough. Um, and to make sure that, you know, you're also looking at visual contrast, you're looking at levels of lighting, which is one thing that we hear a lot from our buildings that do have older demographics or even, you know, private residences when we work with people as they're getting older, or we do our client's second or third house or whatever, they come back to us and they say, you know, I am now needing much brighter lighting, you know, so how can we do that? How can we dial up the lighting? How can we dial down the lighting in places where we need it, you know, so they're the very simple kinds of things that I think can be done to make a place really feel like it's catering to a certain kind of a demographic, you know, for to welcome younger people is, I would say, a little bit easier, but on the other hand, um, they also tend to um, go through trends much more quickly. So our approach to that is really to be more sort of classic about it, you know, and that's again, another area where introducing tech into um, a building is great because we find that younger generations are so used to using technology to access things, to make them work, to do all of these things. And they like the freedom of, and the ability of doing that very quickly you know, if we're able to do that. And that's one thing I think that actually crosses both demographics. You know, if you can actually have an app that's easy enough to use or, you know, a very simple thing, like if you have a building and uh, there is no doorman or the doorman is out for a certain period of time or whatever, or there's an a, a extra entry door into your floor that you need to open and release, if you're able to do that through your phone, mm -hmm. it's so much easier for people. And that's something that crosses, I think, both demographics, you know, in terms of being an attractive amenity, in terms of being something that's easy enough to implement. That's good. Um, so what are some ways that you can also, I don't know if you have experience with this, but um, changing spaces, reprogramming spaces in a building um, that would allow the building to be profitable um, and allow for profit generation? Um, I guess you know, maybe something that comes to mind is something that you both were just discussing earlier would be adding an element of maybe a small cafe in a lobby if your building is big enough. Um, but maybe what are some experiences you might have had to that or, um, you know, is that something you don't generally do? Well, the entity we, we, get, we get involved in it. We get asked all the time. I mean, that's one of the biggest questions we get asked from our buildings is how can we get income? Where, where do we have income space? And what Winston brought up a very interesting thing. I forget what building you were doing it in. One of the things that's happening is, for instance, I think he mentioned the dry cleaning or the cleaning aspect of automated cleaning drop-offs. And typically, if you have a small space in a building where you can have an operator come in and do that, they'll usually return some income to the building for that. Uh, things such as a small, I, I, we said it before, not necessarily an F and B, 
but a small convenience station where you'll have an operator that will stock it that will give the building a percentage of their income or their profits or whatever. Uh, there's also the old adage back to, and again, this will be seeing how we come out of the pandemic where you had amenity spaces that would be able to rent out to residents, you know, whether they wanted to have a holiday gathering, or whether they wanted to rent out the media room for a family movie night, that type of thing. So that's, we always get asked that. Uh, and I think that's, you know, it's, that's going to be a, a request from here to eternity is, you know, how, how can we maximize our space from a monetary value? And a lot of times it's, you know, it's not, it's not that easy. It, 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 either the building doesn't have the space nor the demographic to support something like that. Correct. Uh, Doug hit it and we all hit it, Suchi as well. It's um, the revenue generated in spaces that can be rentable um, and flexibility so that you have multiple parties. You know, you don't want to have only one amenity space where one group rents it and you can't have your party as well. So flexibility and convenience is always a part of luxury and will bring back revenue and prestige to the building. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that, and Doug's hitting on it, if, even if you couldn't have an F&B venue that worked where your numbers work, one of the things we saw in Hong Kong was the approach to using something like an Amazon Ghost shop which has limited manpower, yet you can get food and just pay with your Prime card, et cetera, and go through there. They were gonna do something of that nature, but with their own brand of grocery store. We also saw when I was there in these large developments, a lot of vending machines, believe it or not, but not like vending machines we have over here with just a bunch of snacks and soda or water, they actually had lunches, like, I don't know, soups or sandwiches. And I don't know how often they get used. Like I said, the, the developments that we see, if we have a, a 60, 7,500 unit residence, that's pretty big. They, they're in the hundreds, a thousand. So, and you'll see a few towers all in one zone. So they get a lot of foot traffic who can support those. But the different types we of have a lot, very right. We have a lot, Winston, in, in, in echoing what you said, we have a good number of buildings in our Florida market, uh, particularly of the newer construction of the say 400 to 500 unit size that have that type of you know thing. Nobody mans it, it's totally automated. They have both vending, they have uh, loose uh, items, and it is. Right. incredibly it is it is one of the biggest amenities that's used in that building particularly weekend evenings that type of thing yeah i saw yeah. a uh, champagne and, and, vending no. machine that i would like in my building <laughs> that yeah. needs to be on the trends <laughs> sorry I mean, if you can find the right product to put in the vending machine think about it uh the the residents have access to it 24 7. That's right, especially champagne, dangerous. No, I'm kidding. Um, all right, so to, to cap this off, um, sorry, to, to cap this off, um, and you guys are so wonderful to be here this evening, I just wanted to um, ask, are there any specific design approaches that you wanna leave our, our audience with and just you know getting to know you and, and your abilities? Well, I would just say that you know key to delivering a good project and creating a new a great space for your constituents is really understanding what they need you know like doug was saying really being very careful to listen to your populace to know what they might want and to really be able to interpret that and to be very very clear about budgets one of the things that we're very careful about is actually being very clear about the budget and being able to design very efficiently to that because um designing efficiently i think it just solves a lot of problems from the outset um, so that you can actually lead people with an uplifting space. So then once you have all of the criteria, then the strategy and the process is to really look at what could you do that would give you the maximum effect 
for what you're able to spend and the amount of time you can put into it and what um, kind of maintenance program it can have, you know, what kind of what kind of effect is it going to have in terms of uplifting in the building. So that's really the approach that we would take towards it and to really creating a space that feels um, wonderful for them. Uh, I further that and agree with Sushi 100%. It has to respond to the residents and also to the client. And that said, I think our approach is always, you know, last in beauty, you know, trying to decipher and also protect the client from themselves in some, in some instances where we try to give a very universal appealing, you know, timeless beauty to the architectural palette or things that are going to cost a lot of money in the renovation and let the, pick our battles with the trendier um, pieces in the FF&E and the accessories in some ways, where that might change in a few years, yet we would like, you know, the, the, the bulk of the spending to really last, you know, 10, 20 years if possible. That's great. Well, I think from my, end, from my end, one of the biggest things, and we've all discussed it amongst the panel, is basically you want to do you want to do an amenity space that's going to be used the worst thing is to create an amenity space that no one uses yeah. and because that, that'll create more problems than anything both literally and politically in, a, in an association yeah no that's that's very wise advice um so I guess just to to finalize this, you know, um, Doug, obviously here at ACAM, you have a lot of steps that um, you we would want to speak with you as far as the individual buildings are concerned. But you know, for next steps on how you would go about, you know, upgrading your building, you would obviously have a budget analysis. Um, and if there is any additional information that you're looking to get from either ACAM, Suchi, or Winston, um, we are happy. Again, our emails will be provided at the end up here. We're going to also circulate a thank you, which will also have our information. And um, I really, really wanted to appreciate, you know, say thank you. I, I want to appreciate you. Um, I do appreciate you, but I also want to say thank you so much for all of you for attending tonight. Um, I want to thank Winston Kong from Shampala Mode, Suchi Reddy from ReadyMade, and Doug Weinstein from ACAM um, for your wonderful advice and your forecasting abilities um, for trends, and, and thank you for that. So um, from us at ACAM, have a great night, and hopefully you'll come on for our next one. But anyway, thank you, guys. Thank we you. Thank you. Looking forward thank to you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Have a good, good night. night. Thank <laughs> you. Nice to meet you. Nice. Nice to see you guys. <laughs>